glad you showed up. <laughs> Thank you very much. You didn't ever say there's no limit. You get an old soldier. <laughs> you know, when when I was going to get on. What is that? It's just two mics together. Okay. Well, well, I just got to think. When, when MacArthur was one of the great generals of all time, and as you remember, toward the end of World War II, he was, he was, uh, he was called home by a captain, you know, <laughs> in World War One, and that was so true. But, and he didn't like it. He, he did a wonderful job, as you all know, a wonderful job. But, but he was going a little too much, you know. And so when he, when he got back, he. It wasn't television in those days, but there was a, a, a the radio, and he gave a great impassioned speech, and he said, up at West Point, there's a statue, it's, and it, it, the title of the statue is, Old Soldiers Never Die, They Only Fade Away. <laughs> they don't fade away, boy, I'll tell you, the altitudes are higher, the, the black is thicker, and every year it gets a little higher and a little thicker. <laughs> well, I didn't have any idea much about what you want to hear about, except my first favorite, well, my second favorite love is the B-24. As some of you maybe have heard of the other one. And, and I'm glad to come, and I, I didn't have a, too much of a background of what I was going to say. Oh, I thought this. This is a... This came over, and those of you in the back, now you come see later, you see it's a, it was an ad by Consolidated. Uh, and it must have come early because I see two or three people there that were shot down, and I thought they were shot down before this. If they were, <laughs> they signed it after. But anyway, it's signed by, and maybe some of you will see some names. I reread some that I've seen today. One was George Brown, and maybe some of you heard of him. He was one of our pilots. And, he later became the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. But uh, that's the way we looked in the sky. And I, I, I see P, 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 uh, P-38s. They were all in southern England. I never saw one up in northern England where we were, or well, up in, uh, in uh, the Norfolk area. But uh, boy, you can see those others. And I think there's black crosses on some of them. <laughs> they, I'll tell you, that was one of the greatest days of our life when the first, first uh, P-51 showed up, and the P-38, uh, not the P-38s, we didn't see them, but P-47s, and they were a marvelous, marvelous help. You know, the, the Spitfire has a kind of an elliptical wing. Well, when the, when the P-51 showed up from the side, it was hard to tell the difference. Well, you know, we have a kind of a sharp thing on our airplane, and that's this. And I guess a lot of you remember that. They had this. They also had some. They also had the 20 millimeter. They were worse. But anyway, the P, the, the Spitfires, when they see us up there after the P31 showed up, they kept giving us the profile constantly, all the time. Because <laughs> you know they they know that many of our guys don't know too much about what was going on. And they did that. Well, I I presume it'd be kind of nice to tell you a little bit about the Pro SP mission. Uh, it was a, it was the greatest thing, of, I guess, of my time, and it was a wonderful opportunity to go and feel like that you could do something worthwhile. What I'd like to precede this by saying, I'd like to tell you about the the anatomy of Congressional Medal of Honor, the anatomy of two Congressional Medals of Honor, and I'll tell you how that all happened. Uh, as many of you know, we. Uh, I was the 93rd bomb group. We were the first B-24 to arrive in Britain, in Britain in the war. I'd been on a mission over there before, so I had to tell all the guys about shillings and pants and stuff. But uh, it was a grand experience to go back and have a chance to arrive early. Well, not, there was no bandage vanish to arrive early. But there was only one group of B-24s and two groups of B-17s, and one of them had gone home. So anyway, we... We were pretty well with ourselves out there, but uh, we we had we, uh, maybe I'll just tell you a little bit about the background. I see certain folks here, some young people that didn't know about a B-24. Uh, our bomber was made to fly at about 24 or 25,000 bombing. The B-17 would go a mile higher. Too bad they couldn't carry bombs. But anyway, they. Uh, <laughs> 
I'm just happy that it's my turn to do it. Every time I go to a convention, they always say, oh, you, you, you flew the crate that the B-17 came over in, didn't you? <laughs> well, I left the paper home today that I was going to bring, and I'm just sick halfway up here. I remembered I'd left it. And before I say anything further, I've got to tell you what that paper said. Many of you know the name of Roger Freeman. How many of you ever heard that name, Roger Freeman? He's, he's probably the greatest uh, statistician of the 8th Air Force that ever was. He lived by a, a B-17 base, and as a little kid, he watched them come in, and when one didn't come in, he'd write it down, and then he's been to my house when we made this film, uh, Winging a Prayer, The Saga of Utah Man. That's a film maybe some of you have seen. When he came to my house to, uh, to visit with us so we would get some things exactly correct. And, and he, but he did, he's written a book called The Mighty Eighth and several others. And it's, it's a really a, a very interesting book and he's very accurate. And, and uh, one thing that I think is very accurate, he, he made a list and it came out in the Air Force News, I can't remember when or anyway, an Air Force publication, of all the bomb groups of Great Britain, uh, or of the Eighth Air Force, and how they stood, the, the amount of missions they've been on, the amount of airplane losses, and the amount of people lost. And I take great, you know I wouldn't tell this story if it didn't have a good ending. <laughs> the 93rd bomb group went on more missions than any other bomb group and lost less men than any bomb group that had been over 200 missions. Now those that got there and flew three missions and went home, they, they didn't lose too many. But the 93rd is first, and guess who's second? The 44th. Anybody here from the 44th? Or the 93rd? The our people all live somewhere else. The reason we had a 93rd bomb, or a 93rd convention, or I mean a, an 8th Air Force convention in Salt Lake recently, and I was the only member of the 93rd that showed up. But anyway, that, that, if any of you want to have those statistics again, I'd be very proud to send them to you. There's a few B-17s right high on the list, about 4th and 3rd, and maybe but not 1st or 2nd. Well, let me tell you about this great event. Uh, as you know, we, we bombed in, in France, mainly just western France, Saint Nazaire and Lorient and the and the uh, uh, and all, all the other uh, what is that thing? Of course, a submarine. But well, you get as old as I am, you have a hard time getting the word out. We've been bombed the submarine pans. And they were 16 feet thick on top. And the only way you could any, do any good is to get one through the window or through the door. They went in and out. And I don't suppose we did much of that. But and then the, the Germans were very smart. They had a big battleship that was not right commissioned yet. And they knew how in America the high command always thinks a lot of the Navy. Now, I'm not going to make fun of the Navy because they used to bring us all our mail and our food. And, it was very nice. <laughs> anyway, the, the high command has always been very proud of the Navy. Billy Mitchell's story not to be forgotten because he just about lost his life over the fact he wanted to prove that a bomber could do a lot of damage. Anyway, the Germans had this marvelous battleship that wasn't quite commissioned. And they've got places like like Bremerhaven and Bremen and other places where they make battleships and all. But they brought that thing down and had it fixed right in western France. And why? But because we were so anxious that we were told so much to get that ship that we flew almost daily to St. Nazaire and Lorient. And every time we go, we lose airplanes to bomb a ship that never would have been fixed anyway. So that was one thing. Well, now, you know, all the, all the, uh, I'll say the sad stories. I'll tell you, I'll see you even a better one. We flew for, we were, in night, I was, I was cycling one day, and here came the 44th flying down our runway. And you know what that does to a pilot. <coughs> Adjoining the group, to have to have go eight feet along your runway in formation. And so I went to the colonel to see what I could get. He said, never mind, never mind, something big is happening. You're going to go away, and you're going to go to Africa and go on a special bombing mission. So that was when they were doing their first practicing over our base. So sure enough, we flew to Africa. That was the 93rd, the 
44 and the 389. They were, they were 389 had just arrived, and uh, those three groups, and a group is 37 airplanes, uh, and so that made 37 times 3 is over 100. And that many airplanes flew to Africa, and there were two groups down there, the 98th and the 376. And our group, the 93rd, actually had been down there the winter before, when America attacked uh, from Casablanca and those places in, on November the 8th, 1942. We, three of our squadrons went to Africa. Our squadron was left to do anti sub patrol and uh, to that great uh, armada, and what it was, leaving Ireland and southern England to go down the west coast of Africa, northwest coast of Africa, to attack and and, uh, and catch Rommel him in the other way. By the way, they never quite caught him. He got him away somehow. But uh, they, they finally, they finally uh, arrived down there. And we, that's what we were doing. But now it's, uh, it's in June of 1943, and we were told we're going to fly to Africa where we bomb a special target. It takes three, three days. You have the first day to fly down to south, southeast, southwest England, and the next day, or the next night, of course you always fly at night, so you can let the enemy know where you are. I don't know how they find there at night and daytime, but they sure know you. But anyway, they flew down, we flew down uh, to Cat to Marrakesh, and then the next morning, for the, all day we s s slept. Well, just spend a winter in England and try to speak and sleep a night in Africa. You know there's a difference in this world. But anyway, the next night we flew across to and Gaza, which is the closest point of North Africa to the to the southern part of, of Europe, and as we as we circled the base, I I looked down and saw about 800 guys that had been sent from the night Air Force to take care of our ground crews. You know, you, you took uh, as you know there there uh, there's many many people on the on the base that don't get in the air. And they, we only could take two of them with us, besides our crew and some other things. But the, the night, Air Force had sent these guys over to take care of us, and we circled the base early morning and landed. And I had named my ship Utah Man, so I wanted the guys, anybody from that group from Utah, to know that we were in the war. I also wanted the people from Texas to know. I'm <laughs> lying <laughs> right with them all the time. That's the reason he got his name, besides I'm very proud of this state. But anyway, the funny thing was, the next morning, we, we had our tent there, and the guys were in playing poker, and of course, you know, I didn't do much of that, so I was out lining, riding Utah man in the sand, and then painting the rocks, you know, to make it look kind of uh, southern exposure. And here came some of the guys from the ground crew, that had arrived right from, from this, from the, the a, a, from the guys that had been sent out to take care of us. You would think we were in a different country. They were all dark and deep, and here we were all pale faced. You know, England has nine months of winter and three months of cold weather, and so <laughs> you, just looked, you just looked like two different nations. And these guys get by looking at us, and boy, they sure, they sure thought we were anemic. I'm sure of that. But anyway, we, we they, oh, and they really did a good job taking care of us in the mess hall, even the mess hall wasn't too bad. Anyway, we just, at, we just looked at an Arab and see what they eat. We were really well treated. But, uh, finally, we, we were, then while we were there, we were uh, on the 26th of June, 1943. We were, the, of course, the war was really on. And Germany had just been pushed out, if you all remember, on, I think it was the 8th of May from Cape Bon, which is way over by Tunis. And, and they, they had got their men out. Uh, in fact, uh, I had to fly over one day to uh, Tunis. This one guy had landed there, I had to change an engine, I had to go take his crew back. And boy, you, right outside of there was a German prison camp. Those guys are handsome people, tall, great looking guys. I said, why are we fighting guys like this? They sure look good. But anyway, that's, a, that's just beside the point. But anyway, finally we, we, we did bomb I, we were the first to bomb Rome. In fact, George Brown, who later became the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, as you know, he he was a command pilot, and they took my we flew in the lead to bomb Rome. 
Now, when you bomb Rome, you've got a lot of opposition. There's a rather large church over there, and uh, they don't want American city. And that's not, it's not Italy, you know. The Vatican City is a country of its own, and they were neutral. So as we got, as we came down from the north to uh, bomb, and Hitler made a demo, here I'm getting on it. I got a bag of her. No, I'll tell you this part. Hitler, <laughs> Hitler was stupid. This morning was stupid. And the rail, he couldn't do much about it. All the railroads of Italy came by Rome like an hourglass. All of them, they, they just passed through there, so there were about eight rails wide. What a beautiful target. And so when we got near there, I said to George, in fact, before we got there, all of a sudden there was something hitting our airplane from above. You couldn't tell. We'd been told, look out for for uh, uh, aluminum, I think they said. There's going to be stuff come down, and that'll, that'll, that, that'll joy up you somehow. I don't know, and then, or blow you up or something. So <coughs> when this coming down, we thought, oh, this is a hand. This, they've got a secret weapon. But we still kept going. And finally, we got to Rome, and I said to George, I, I Colonel Major Brown then, I said, if you don't mind, I'd like to be able to get down in the Bombay and see if we would really do hit the railroad yards and miss, Ro and miss the Vatican City. Go ahead, that'll be fine. So I climbed down and said, boy, of all the pretty sights, you know, you see them when they first drop. We carried, I think we carried six 500s that day. You see them when they first drop, and then you don't see them for a long time, about 12, 15, 18, 20 seconds. And then they, they hit one great big ammunition train. <laughs> that was a thrilling sight, you know. People around, and so <laughs> just a great on Rome. Well, then when we got back, you should have heard the stories. Did you see that that stuff they dropped on us? I saw an airplane, what one of the guys said. He saw an airplane blow up when it hit the front of the, the, the sail and blew up the airplane and down they went. And others got uh, turned away and got out so they wouldn't get hit. Nobody knew what it was. Three days later, one of the ground crew was in the cell of the B-24, and there was a little thing in there. He pulled it out, and it was a note saying, look out, you people of Vatican City and Rome. We're not bombing your city. Words to that effect. We're letting you know that we're bombing the railroad yards. And there were leaflets that were dropped by a mosquito just ahead of us. And so you see, one guy saw there, and go up. The guys turned back. <laughs> All of our stories aren't like that, but some of them are. But uh, anyway, we also, uh, we another thrilling thing, on the 9th of July, 1943, we took up at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And that's very unusual, you know, we always went morning just to, make, just to make sure that the sun was right in our eyes all the way to Germany. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we took up at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and went to Sicily. As we got nearly to Sicily, at about, only about 13 or 14,000, very low altitude. Somebody said, look, there's a commando raid. Look at that. That's the British name. We have we call them uh, Rangers, the Ranger raid. The Ranger raid. There were about six or seven little ships heading for that island. And then Waste Gunner said, I saw one over here, and another one over here, and another over there. Now you know what it was. The 9th of July, 1943, 8th of July, and 9th when they hit they were, was the invasion of Sicily. You don't think that was a thrill. Uh, and we even flew low. You know, it was kind of fun. We flew low. We saw the guys down there attacking. Of course, we didn't stick around. But anyway, we, we saw the invasion of Sicily. And when we got back, it was the first sign that we may be able to go home someday. The first invasion of Europe was not D-Day. It was Sicily on the 8th and 9th of July, 1943. My wingman, by the way, I won't take time to tell this story, but just the fact that, you know, at night, you don't fly formation, and so as soon as it gets dark, you flash a light on top so the submarines won't see you. You flash a light on top, and your wingman goes down to 500 feet, and then it goes up to 500, so if you stay there, you're separated, and you land. You land about, and then when we got into the ready room, and they came and we told them that the invasion of Sicily, God, even even the broadcast people had heard that and knew they were just thrilled. We were guys were dancing and everything about the thrill of bombing Sicily and about the invasion of Europe. And then we went to bed and about four in the morning, Ramsey Potts, my 
and our executive officer woke me up. He said, where's McKelvey? I said, he's on my wing about, I know it was not 10 minutes. Then I got too dark and I thought we better separate. He said, he's not back. I said, it can't be. We were 10 or 15 minutes. Of course, we don't hardly have the flashing lights you got on our airports here. And very, very poor <laughs> systems like they now have. They just, these pilots nowadays, they, they read the life magazine over and back. You know, they don't have like we, we didn't have too many lights, but they did have those little flares like you see, and that was our runway. But until we missed the first mission, and he crashed along the British, along the African coast, they had these little darky stations. And many of you remember what darky was, a little station that if you could hear it, you're 10 miles away from it. But they could hear you a long ways away. And all along, they had it. And it just so happened that one of those British guys said, hey, these Americans don't fly in the daytime, at the, I mean at night. They only fly in the daytime. Fre frequency, the daytime frequency, always ended at, at 6 p.m. And the one guy along, there's one every 10 miles, and he was, you know, I'm gonna map it, you know the longest of what it is. And he just said, I think they may be still on the daytime frequency. And he flipped over and heard him say, bailing out, out of you. And they crashed. But there's only one. And you know, if there's two, you've got a cross. If there's three, you've got a triangle. And then you've got to be in that center. There's only one, you've got only, well, you find in a hurry, there's only 2,000 miles. Maybe out there in the African desert. Anyway, we didn't finally find him and bring him in, but that was a uh, shocker. Well, then finally, on the on, uh, the 31st of July, 1943, uh, 17 men came in about three fancy cars to our base and said we, it was Saturday. We knew the big mission, the big mission was coming soon because everything was getting closer and closer. It was Saturday, and they arrived. We met. We all gathered around, we sat on these, sat on these little five-gallon cans, the swastikas <coughs> on the side. That's the way the Germans wanted to gas their airplanes. Do you see why they lost the war? <laughs> right there. Imagine, 2,300 gallons of five-gallon cans. We have nice ships, we have nice big bags. Come back. 
we don't, and we not only come back, they tear up the mission and throw it away. Remember, you've got, you've got, we always used to say, you've got 10 minutes. If everything goes perfect, on most targets, you've got about 10 minutes ahead of them. And I think at B-25 or something, B-17, only had three minutes, but we had 10. I'm just... <laughs> but anyway, you just have about 10 minutes to be ahead of them. And boy, what a precious 10 minutes that would be, because in those, those swap rules and others, they didn't know where we were going to bomb them, and that time they find it. So that's about what it was. So he says, that is not the case today. He said, they will not tear up this mission. He said, I've never seen them so dedicated in my whole life. Most of them know very well it's a deadly, deadly mission, and most of them are very dedicated to the fact you're going to go over there and destroy seven refineries. He said, and if we don't hit them, and I was sitting about where you are, but he said, if we don't, hit them, they will, they'll, they'll, send, they'll send us back tomorrow. If only five of us get back. And by the way, you, Lieutenant Stewart, you are my deputy lead. My friend, I was training with Roper, my old buddy from Oak City, all that time, training with him back in the third wave or so. Now I, of course, this is the 31st mission, so I was the oldest pilot in the group, and uh, it was a real honor. <coughs> it was kind of joke, it was a nice honor to be deputy lead. <clears throat> and he said, that's the, way, that's the way it will be. They will, if we don't get, if we only get five airplanes back here tomorrow, they'll send us on Monday. So you guys hit that target. He said, I really mean it. And then he put his hand on John Gerstad's shoulder. Addison Baker, John Gerstad. And I'm sitting about that bar when he said, we're going over that target tomorrow. If we go over in planes, we're going over it. Because we know what they need. And then when he turned to me, he said, you're my deputy lead. Because Capri said that they're going over the planes. But nice, nice title he had there. But that was a determined statement if I'd ever heard in my life. And John was nodding his head. John from Racing, Wisconsin. Well, then we were away. We went back and had our little evening together and everything. And finally, the next morning, sure enough, you know, you used to kind of be glad when there's clouds all over, and you go, oh, oh, they'll call it off. No way over the desert, Sarah Area Desert, they don't have clouds. <laughs> and so sure enough, yes, that, that, or, that morning we met the, the, the briefing about 4.30 or 5, and we were told where the mission would be and where we would turn. You fly across the Mediterranean Sea at about 15, about 1,500 feet, no need for offshoot, and then you climb to about 16,000 which you really would need oxygen just to get over the Denarian Alps. And then you would come to the Danube River, and, there, then you, and they told us that we had good maps. Yeah.